Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter three, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, and we'll read one verse. And uh, some have a handout, and follow along with that uh, if you'd like. Um, try to keep us on track here. Last of the Baptist distinctives I've been talking about for a few weeks here. Uh, I think this is number five. So this um, is a, an important uh, truth for sure. It is, uh, tonight's topic is, um, why we interpret the script, the Bible, scriptures literally, and how that is uh, goes into um, our preaching, our teaching, and our living, and why we do what we do. There's some, there's some uniqueness to our church. Uh, there's uniqueness to uh, Baptist churches. Uh, I think we find ourselves in the minority among those that would call themselves Christians, broad sense, those that would claim to follow Christ, we find ourselves in the minority, for instance, with regard to we baptize by immersion, okay? So we're in the, we're in the minority. So uh, we don't go out of our way to be in the minority, but it, often the Bible puts us in the minority if we take it at face value and apply the truths as they're given in Scripture in the literal meaning of their words, that constrains us to practice to practice uh, baptism. Practice that's a ooh, Thursday night to practice baptism by immersion. It constrains us to do that. Otherwise, um, we are creating a. I think a very what is a very important doctrine. We're creating our own take on it or a different take than the Bible. And so we find ourselves in the minority certain times compared to Christianity as a whole. Why is that? Well, certain churches influenced by universities, seminaries, and colleges, pastors are always influenced by universities, seminaries, and colleges. That's where most churches, their, their pastors uh, have been trained at some uh, universe, some institution that influences the pastors of churches, and then those pastors teach people, and that teaching um, affects uh, belief and practice for that church. And so um, there are many uh, <clears throat> universities, seminaries, divinity schools, and colleges that um, would teach um, what's called the allegorical method of Bible interpretation. In other words, the Bible, uh, what it reads, the, the true meaning is a deeper meaning than what you can see right there. The true meaning lies beneath that, and it's up to the, uh, it's up to the preacher or the interpreter of the scriptures to tell you what that secret, hidden, deeper meaning really is. And so throughout history, um, this has created... Uh, a lot of false belief and practice in churches. And so one of the distinctives of Baptists is that they've been people of the book. They've just been committed to go to the Bible, to study the Bible, to see what the words say, and to practice them that way. And so the first part of this lesson uh, <clears throat> going to be a little bit of the background uh, between the two different, generally the two different ways that people look at the Bible and preach it. One is allegorically, the other is literally. And at the end, I like to take as much time as we have. I've got a few passages of Scripture written out, and we're going to take a look at those passages of Scripture and see what happens if we uh, apply the wrong method of Bible interpretation to those passages. We can see a lot of the things that uh, are practiced in churches today stem from that. And so this isn't as much... Um, this is a little bit more of why we interpret the Bible literally. We, we do. This is not a corrective message necessarily, but this is more why this is one of our distinctives. And it's one we should be, uh, we should be proud of and uh, we should not be ashamed of. And um, we'll see throughout history, certain men, really they gave their life uh, because they wanted people like you and I uh, to be able to have the Bible in our language that we can read and interpret literally and live by. And so we, we owe a debt to those that have gone before that have been willing to be in the minority. They've just been willing to be in the minority. And so there's always going to be a pull for us to, 
you know, fit in the mainstream, <laughs> whatever it is. But, uh, you know, broad is the way, the Bible says, that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads into life. And so never be ashamed that we're on the narrow way, just so our way is biblical. That's the big thing. That's the big test. And so um, by way of introduction here, um, <clears throat> first, uh, 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study study to show thyself approved unto God. I love that verse because that's, for, that's not just for Timothy. Paul is definitely speaking to Timothy here. But by extension, he's speaking to you and I too. So we can study God's word. We can do more than read it. We can even do more than meditate on it. We can study it. Were you convicted like I was that a false religion pauses five times a day to pray? When sometimes we have to hang our heads that we think we've done a great service and we're walking, you know, in spiritual plane if we squeeze that 10 minutes in at the start of our day. That's a false religion, five times a day. And they stop what they're doing. I mean, they build their businesses, their businesses even stop because that's how much they are committed to that. That's convicting. Uh, but here we have this command in the Bible, study to show thyself approved unto God, a great opportunity to study. Um, last week, drove uh, past uh, my mom's old homestead and uh, her grandmother's house. And um, so I never knew my, I never knew her grandfather, my great-grandfather, he died the year I was born, but she always says, I wish you could meet him. I wish you could have met him. She said, one day in heaven, you'll enjoy talking to him. So I said, tell me a little bit about him. Well, among other things, she said he had this little uh, shed, I guess you could say, out in the back uh, yard there. We kept some of his tools, but he also had a, a desk in there. And she said he'd go back out there and he would take time and he'd read his old Thompson Chain study Bible and would mark it up. And he, he wasn't a pastor. He was a, a laborer and um, you know, faithful to church, loved the Lord, but he, just, he also loved to study the Bible. And I think about that. I think it's a great a privilege. I think it, it could be lost opportunities in our life if we find ourselves with gaps of time where we're not ourselves taking advantage of studying the Bible. It's a command of God to do. We have the ability, we have the availability of Scripture to do it. We have more tools than ever at our resource. We have a library packed with books right up there, and we have thousands of good, solid resources online. We have the Bible in every format you can think of. <laughs> we can read it. We can listen to it. We can listen to it dramatized. But do we? That's just really the rubber meets the road. Do we? So it says study, to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing, making the right assessment about the scriptures as they're given. So we'll pray, and then we'll go through our lesson here this evening. Thank you, Lord, for this time we can gather together on this Thursday night. And we pray, Lord, that the spirit of thanksgiving that was so prominent in our minds and hearts over the last few days would not be seasonal, but rather something that's permanent, it's a part of the way we think and how we act, how we speak, Lord, our mindset. May we be faithful in prayer as we saw even a false religion, faithful, diligent, to a God that's not real, how much more, Lord, if you being real to us, should we be people of prayer and people of the book? And I pray, Lord, this simple lesson tonight, it's a practice that our church has done from its inception to inter the, interpret the Bible literally. But Lord, I pray that uh, we would see a way to apply this to our own individual lives tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As history has proven, Scripture can be made to say just about anything. Right? A lot of people hold the Bible up and say something and you say, that's not what the Bible says. Um, how is this possible? The issue is primarily not with the scriptures themselves, but rather with the method used to interpret the scriptures and then after that to preach them or teach them. So let's consider two methods, the two main methods, key methods, primary methods of scripture interpretation uh, that are uh, taught and practiced today in churches, college, seminaries. Number one here is the allegorical method. What does that mean? Here's the definition. This method of Bible interpretation treats the, treats the literal sense as the vehicle for a secondary, more spiritual prof, 
profound sense. The emphasis becomes on the spiritual meaning, not on the literal meaning that uh, we read, so that the original words have little or no significance. In other words, there's a deeper hidden meaning. And unfortunately, along with the allegorical method, comes teachers and preachers who claim to be the ones who know the deeper message. Not us, not the, not the normal guy in the pew. No, we've got to rely on that enlightened teacher uh, who has found the hidden meaning. So that is the definition. What are some dangers with allegorical interpretation method of Bible study, preaching, and teaching? Number one, it does not interpret Scripture. Here's a quote. It will be noticed at once that its habit is to disregard the common uh, signification or meaning of words and give wing to all manner of fanciful speculation. It does not draw out, draw out the legitimate meaning of an author's language, but foists, that's a f- fun word right there, don't use very often, so enjoy using that word tonight. It foists into it whatever the whim or the fancy of the interpreter, we might say the preacher or teacher might desire. So he gets to take the scripture and talk about the real deeper hidden meaning underlying it, um, <clears throat> and in, in so doing, no longer interpret scripture. Number two, the second danger of this method is that the basic authority ceases to be the scriptures, but instead it becomes the mind of the interpreter or the preacher. That becomes the authority. We are left without any means by which the conclusions of the interpreter, the preacher, the teacher may be tested. We don't have a means to test them anymore if the meaning is a deeper hidden meaning that only a select few know. Okay. Well, does that sound like uh, something that goes against uh, much of Scripture? Uh, where the Bible uh, commends the Bereans Uh, that they searched the scriptures daily, whether these things were so. They searched the scriptures, and we are given the idea in that passage that if they would but search the scriptures, they would be able to know the truth of what was being taught. The scriptures were their guide and their rule, not the uh, uh, hidden interpretation of the speaker. Dwight Pentecost wrote a good book. He wrote several books, one on the life of Christ, another, in other words, another one on the end times. But he says this here at the bottom of that first page. To state that the principal meaning of the Bible is a second sense meaning, in other words, something that's hidden, and that the principal method of interpretation is spiritualizing, is to open the door to almost uncontrolled speculation and imagination. So it's dangerous. The allegorical method is dangerous when we talk about this deeper meaning, this hidden meaning, it's an underlying meaning because it no longer interprets scripture and the basic authority ceases to be the scriptures themselves. Whereas we know and we have been taught and we practice, scriptures are the best interpreters of scriptures and they will stand uh, along with each other. There's a unity there. What about the history? Um, Not to get too Deep here, but there's three guys, three old guys, like really old, like over a thousand years old. They're dead now, but they lived uh, many years ago, not long after the time of Christ. And um, they were some of the early, early promoters of this, the hidden meanings of Scripture. They would take a parable, and every little part of a parable they would give a spiritual meaning to. I mean, the parable of the uh, Good Samaritan. They have a spiritual meaning and application for every little move that that poor Good Samaritan made. I mean, every move was a spiritual, deeper meaning. Like, wow. Uh, he, uh, and really, I think the point of the parable was just to tell us who's our neighbor. And God says that. The Bible says that's what I'm giving you this parable for. It's answer, who's my neighbor? Um, but uh, the uh, early interpreters here, some heretical, Philo, Origen, Augustine, Uh, they desired to unite philosophy with the word of God. Okay, this is an introduction of philosophy into scriptures. 
Not scriptures themselves. That wasn't enough. We need to introduce human reasoning and philosophy into it to give you the real deeper meaning. So that's kind of a warning sign here that uh, our preaching and teaching and understanding of scripture not be based on philosophy. The Bible calls it rudiments of this world, but on Christ and the sufficiency of his scripture. So Pentecost says here, this does not present the truths of the word of God, but rather perverts them. As opposed to that is uh, what we believe to be and know to be the true way of interpreting scripture, and that's the literal method. So if you're following along there, the definition, the literal method is the method of Bible interpretation that gives to each word the exact same basic meaning it would have in normal, ordinary usage, in writing, thinking, or speaking. Well, there's a new thought. How about that? <laughs> but if we just take the words and their meaning and take them at face value. See, but the problem there is that's too simple. It's too accessible. Anybody that studies the scripture can do that. That's a good thing, isn't it? Because the fact of the matter is this. Anybody that is willing to do scripture can do that. They can take the scriptures at their face value in their ordinary usage and apply them to their life and live by them and have the faith in those promises to die with those promises that are given in the scriptures. The literal method takes each word as it ex is exact same basic meaning. Evidence. I like this point also that uh, Dwight Pentecost points out in his book. No, how about prophecy? Some prophecy in the Old Testament has already been fulfilled. Some prophecy is yet to be fulfilled. So what can we say about the prophecy that already has been fulfilled? Here's his quote. No prophecy which has been completely fulfilled has been fulfilled any way but literally. So that tells me going forward, I can expect the prophecies of the Bible that have yet to be fulfilled, I can expect them to be fulfilled literally. So that helps me understand uh, the book of Revelation, that it's not some allegorical story like some of the Protestant reformers said about it. They, 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 they couldn't deal with the book of Revelation, A, because um, it didn't fit their theological system just right, uh, which is a sign that maybe the theological system is faulty. Um, but it, it also presents things that uh, we've not seen before and we have to take by faith. Um, but um, back in the book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, here we are in Christmas season. And um, the small little city of Bethlehem is prophesied as going to be the location for Christ's birth, and that was fulfilled literally. And in the book of Daniel, chapter 9, the time of the Messiah is prophesied right down to the time uh, of his death, and that prophecy was fulfilled literally. The time and the place that Jesus would come to earth the first time was, was prophesied. It was fulfilled literally. So now looking forward, I'm believing and I expect the promise of the rapture and the tribulation and Armageddon and the millennium to be fulfilled literally, not in a spiritual sense and uh, not in a figurative sense. Advantages of the literal method, number one, it grounds the interpretation in fact, okay? Two, it has the greatest success in opening up the word of God. It, God's word opens up to us when we study it and understand it in its literal Meaning, and number three, it provides an authority by which the interpretations can be tested. That is something that the allegorical method does not provide. There's no test. Pretty much any speaker, teacher, writer could say whatever they want about a deeper hidden meaning because there's nothing to test it by. That's just his thoughts on that. Whereas if we follow the literal method, we can hear God's word preached and taught, and we can read it, and we can test it by itself. And I think, I am sure, that is what God had intended. So, historical statements regarding the literal method. William Tyndale said this, it's, it's, 
It's his writing, so he lived in the 1500s. So hang on tight. Here's a, here's a longer quote, but I'll, I'll share it with you. Here's what he said about the literal method of Bible interpretation. Thou shalt understand, therefore, that the Scripture hath but one sense, which is the literal sense. And that literal sense is the root and ground of all, and the anchor that never faileth. Whereunto, if thou cleave, thou canst never err or go out of the way. And if thou leave the literal sense, thou canst not but go out of the way. In other words, you leave it, you are going to go out of the way. But you hang tight to that. He said it's a root, it's a ground, it's an anchor that never fails. You know, he really believed that. They weren't just words to him. And, and he believed it this much, that he was willing to um, leave his beloved country of England and live many, the, the last years of his life, kind of on the run uh, in Germany, uh, away from his home because they wanted his head because he was daring to do something that the Roman Catholic Church didn't want done, and that is to put the Bible in the language of common people. So he, he went to the stake and was burned at the stake at the age of 42, having translated um, most, all the Old Testament, much of the, all the New Testament, much of the Old Testament, into the language that you and I speak. He said this, I want the boy out in the field to be able to read the Bible in his language. I know it's, I want him to be able to read it and hear it and be able to listen to that who knows what, Catholic priest, Anglican priest, and say, hmm, does that line up with the Bible? And if not, that young boy can say, you know what, I think I'm gonna follow the Bible. I've got God's words in, in my language. You know, I like thinking of it this way too. If he had that vision of young English-speaking boys in the field was his illustration, plow in the field, they could have the Bible in their language, I think he would be ecstatic today to see all the young boys, girls in our church that also have the Bible in their language. That's why he died. That's why he went to the stake. He wanted the common man all the way down to the teenager to be able to read the Bible and interpret it literally so they could live it. And so here we are 500 years later, and he did what he did, and many others did too, so that all of our teenagers and young adults and middle-aged, and elderly, and wherever all we fit on the spectrum of life could all have this Bible in our hands so that we could read it at face value and believe it and live it. William Tyndale, um, he said, Scripture has but one sense, the literal sense. And then on the back page there, the classic statement on what we give uh, when we're talking about Bible uh, in the Doctrine of the Bible in the college is this statement by David Cooper. It's kind of a classic. When the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. Therefore, take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning, unless the facts of the immediate context, studied in light of related passages and fundamental truths, indicate clearly otherwise. Take every word at its primary, ordinary, usual, literal meaning. So to interpret the Bible properly, what do we want to try to do? We want to seek to understand the words. We understand the words, and we've got English dictionaries that will help us with that. We want to take one more step and study a little bit further. We can take those English words and find out the Greek and Hebrew words behind them and look them up too. We have resources that make that a process that takes less than a minute to look up any word in the Bible in English, its definition, and Greek and Hebrew. We understand the grammar. Okay? Yes, your English teacher, she, she, she wants you to understand grammar. She wanted you to. So, some, some did well in that, and some failed spectacularly in that endeavor. But grammar is important as far as studying the Bible. All right? Context. Context. Cults take Scripture out of context. That's how they're built. Okay, so when we study the Bible, one way to rightly divide the word of truth is to take that word 
in its sentence, the grammar around it, and look at the context in which it's given. And then the historical interpretation. Who was this written to? Who was that, who was that uh, uh, scripture written to? It's Old Testament. Who, what, what era in the Old Testament there? In the New Testament? What, what church? Was it written to a church, a person? So that context helps. And then lastly, we got to understand the figurative language because the Bible does use figures of speech just like we do. Every language does. Here's another thing about figurative language. We'll talk about that for just a second. Tyndale said this, the scripture useth proverbs, similitudes, riddles, or allegories as all other speeches do. But that which the proverb, etc., signifies is over the literal sense, which thou must seek out diligently. In other words, the, Jesus used parables. The parables were used to illustrate a point. There are types and symbols in the Old Testament, and they do signify something else in Scripture. Uh, the tabernacle is filled with types of the life of Christ. It doesn't say that per se every, the first time we hear the tabernacle described in the Old Testament, but as we read through the Bible in its context and see the other times, we see how often the pieces of the tabernacle represent and are alluded to as being a part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And so there certainly are figures of speech. Um, so let's look at some applications quickly here, and uh, we'll illustrate some of these, I hope, uh, here. I just put down six different passages, and the key phrase from each one that we'll try to make, uh, kind of illustrate the difference between allegorical interpretation and literal and where we end up at. So number one, in Matthew 13, 38, Jesus gives the parable of the tares. And in the parable of the tares, uh, the man plants his field. At night, the enemy comes by and sows tares uh, into, uh, in and among the, uh, the, the wheat there. And it's tricky because um, the wheat and the tares, when they first grow up, they look alike. It's not till much later that they're distinct. And by that time, it might be too late uh, to sort to, to, to weed them out. And so Jesus gives the, def, the explanation for that parable, and he says there the field that he's speaking of is the world. In other words, Jesus is saying in the world that we live in, there's going to be wheat, Christians, growing up, and at the same time, there's going to be lost, tares, growing up. And at the end, he will make the final judgment all right, separating the saved from the lost. And we're, it's a very simple parable with a very simple uh, truth behind it. But um, several uh, <clears throat> um, prominent Bible interpreters, writers, um, to fit their method of kind of Bible interpretation, their theological system, literally said the field is the world. And by that, what Jesus meant is that the field is the church. So in the church, there's going to be saved and there's going to be lost and they're going to grow up together and that's fine. In the end, God will sort them out. That's used as a defense of little infants becoming members of the church, okay? infant baptism, membership in the church, and they may grow up and never be saved, but they're a part of the church and that's okay because Jesus said, the field is the church. There's going to be wheat and tares in the church. But, but it's, that's not what he said. He actually said the field is the world, right? So um, we have to take that and say, mm, that interpretation is wrong from the very start because that's not what the Bible says. In the world, yes, they're saved and there's lost and there's going to be a final judgment. Number two, Matthew 16, 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. To the Roman Catholics, that means he is going to build this universal church of which Peter was going to be the first pope. Okay, That's their interpretation. And that church was going to be the visible kingdom of God on this earth. Not a millennium one day. No, the Roman Catholic church is the kingdom of God on this earth. That is their uh, interpretation of that. That is an allegorical interpretation, okay? There is nothing in there that talks about Peter being the first of a long line of popes. That's Roman Catholic doctrine that has enabled them to give this infallible authority to 
popes and councils so that what they say can stand alongside scripture as um, authoritative. But again, we're Baptists and we practice Baptist distinctives. We don't believe philosophy plus scripture is authoritative. We don't believe tradition plus scripture is authoritative. We believe scripture alone is our authority. And so I will build my church. If we want to interpret that literally, we would say the Lord wants to build his assembly and Around him, he'd gathered some disciples and some other people had gotten saved and he was going to continue to build that assembly and he's going to go to heaven. And there was one church when he went to heaven, Church of Jerusalem, and they grew. They really grew at Pentecost and the Lord wanted them to not just stay in Jerusalem. He wanted them to go and become other churches and so he brought persecution in, right? And then the disciples from the church at Jerusalem were scattered, like Philip. He just went and preached in Samaria he preached in Caesarea. He preached to the Ethiopian eunuch. And so church, a church became churches. All right? That's what the Lord is speaking of. I want to build my assembly, uh, not a universal, uh, visible uh, system, as the Roman Catholics would say. Matthew 28, 19. The Bible says baptizing them. Baptizing them. Okay? We want uh, to properly interpret the Bible. We understand the word. What about the word baptize? What about it? What about the word baptize? Dictionary, what does it mean? It has one meaning. It means to immerse. It means to immerse. And when was that done? Look at every po- time in Scripture. An infant's never baptized, not one time. Not one time. People were baptized after they made a statement of faith. That's very clear in, uh, in the book of Acts and uh, in, the, in the Gospels. So it's very clear baptizing uh, is for those that are able to make a statement of their own faith and it's done by immersion because that's what the meaning of the word baptize is. So now if we want to change that into sprinkling infants, just don't take the word baptize out because it's no longer baptism. It's sprinkling. And baptism does not mean sprinkling. It means immersion. And take out the fact that we're baptizing scripturally because that infant can't give a statement of their faith. So you have to bring an allegorical understanding, a deeper, hidden, extra meaning into the term baptize in order to defend or practice infant baptism. Okay? It's allegorical. It's extra. It's like calling a Yugo a car. It's, it's got four wheels, but it's like saying, hey, I just came home and my pet is barking, and it can't wait to see me. It's a cat. Uh, No. No. If it's barking, it's not a cat, and if it can't wait to see you, it's not a cat. (laughs) It's a dog. You can call it a cat, just like you can call infant sprinkling baptism, but that's an allegorical interpretation. That's not a literal definition. This is what Baptists clashed with the Protestants over in the Protestant Reformation. The, the Protestants would say, you're, you're denying baptism. You're denying this person they were baptized. In other words, the Protestant says, baptize as an infant. And the Baptists would say, wait a second, stop. That's not baptism. And it's like, <laughs> they're just, the battle was just, everybody was hitting a brick wall. And praise the Lord for the Baptists who said, I'll walk the narrow road. Because this is what the word means. And this is how the Bible teaches it's practiced. And we're going to limit ourselves to that literal Interpretation. Mark 9, 44, the fire is not quenched. Talking about hell. At the end of his ministry, you can look online. I couldn't get it downloaded in time, but you can look. You can, you can type in uh, Evangelist Billy Graham, literal fire in hell, and you can hear his quote. I think the longer he preached, the more he ecumenicized, got together with the Catholics and even Muslims at the end there. And he said, I think hell's separation from God. He said, is it literal fire? He says, I think hell is separation from God. Well, the Bible teaches otherwise. Unless we're going to add an allegorical interpretation into Scripture, and if we do that, all bets are off. What do you want the Bible to say? Make it say it then. That's not what we're going to do. We don't want that. Our church doesn't want that. But other churches can have that. We don't want that. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four. 
This is my body. This is my body, which is broken for you. Communion, right? This is my body. But the Catholic Church will take that and use that statement of Christ and add what we call absurd literalism to it. Okay, Absurd literalism is when a figure of speech like this metaphor, all right, wherever my English teacher is, should they still be alive and be watching, I just used one of your words, metaphor, a metaphor, this is my body, is a figure of speech, okay? So when the Catholics hold in their hand the wafer and they say that wafer becomes the body of Christ, they're taking this verse and applying it and saying, see, Jesus said, this is my body. That's, that's absurd literalism. That's the other end of the spectrum where you misunderstand and misapply obvious figures of speech. Because if we say, this is my body, what are we going to do when G about when Jesus said, I am the door? I don't know a church that has a holy door that says, no, this door, when the church service starts, becomes the person of Christ. A little, I don't like saying that, but that's how absurd it is. And so to say this wafer is the body of Christ is also faulty interpretation. A lot of people, it's no laughing matter, a lot of people have been misled uh, to a false gospel because of that. So it's serious. Um, and then lastly, 2 Peter 3, 8, where the Bible says, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years. Now, some, maybe a little older, will remember the old date setters. All right, the date setters, they love this verse because they would say, okay, if the earth was created in 4,000 B.C., and one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and the Lord worked, established the Sabbath day, so man would work for six days and would rest on the seventh, hmm, then if one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, if we've already existed for 6,000 years, the, the year, the, the 7,000 year must be the Sabbath year, the year of rest, the year of the millennium. That means the Lord is going to be coming back at the start of the 7,000th year. Because one day is, are you done? I'm done. I'm done. There we go. Okay, so this is where date setters will go, though, and they will see in, this, in that scripture a deeper hidden meaning that you or I didn't see. And I remember being scared to death in 1988. That one day, the Lord is going to come back. I'm like, I, I'm, I know I'm saved. I, I do believe I'm saved. I'm, I'm sure I'm, I know I'm saved. But am I going to wake up tomorrow morning and go to school, or am I going to wake up in heaven? He was dead serious, whoever it was. Take your pick. There's always been a lot of them. All those guys add these numerology and deeper meanings and hidden meanings and really miss out on the clear, simple meanings uh, of Scripture. One day is with the Lord is a thousand years. He's eternal, right? He's always has been, always will be. That's our meaning there. So hopefully that's a little bit uh, helpful for us here this evening. We're glad that we're part of a church that's committed to a literal interpretation of Scripture. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. Bless our remaining time here together. And uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to be committed as we go into this next year to be real students of your word. What a blessing, what a privilege we have to have the scriptures in our own language. May we use it and uh, apply them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.